Arab Cultural Center. Uh, we are very happy to have Jeff Halper here today. Uh, and many thanks both to Jeff for coming and for Women in Black and Paula Abrams uh, t for organizing this event. Abrams Hurani. Abrams Hurani for organizing this event. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, well, I met Jeff before actually, many yeah. years ago. It was in the year 2000, 2001. Uh, and he was leading a tour, uh, showing us the settlements in the West Bank uh, that at the time, I think, were trying to drive a wedge to, to split the West Bank into two to make mm. a contiguous uh, area impossible. And at that time, many people were still... Mm, there were hopes in the Oslo process and in, yeah, yeah. in autonomy and all these things. Now, uh, 17 years later, things look quite different, and I'm looking forward to an update. Okay. Paula? Who is that? It was a very important <laughs> talk. Um, if people have difficulty with, with... If people have difficulty with English, uh, we're very grateful. Magda Asen is in the back, and she will help translate into German for those who have trouble with the English language. She's sitting at the back there. So those of you who feel you can't cope with the English, Magda's there. We're very grateful to her. She's one of the people I wanted to thank. Um, we were able to choose a theme for this evening. And I must say that I wanted to choose this particular theme because this is a theme which is really an international theme about the pacification of populations and, of course, Israel's sale of weapons and weaponry to the world. Um, first, the Women in Black would like to thank a few people, personally, who made this evening possible. Uh, <coughs> unfortunately, Mohammed Abu Rus is not here um, from Okaz. Gregor represented him. Uh, he made it possible for us to use the room this Friday. Um, and he organized our professional video filmer so that uh, we hope that there will be a link where many people can see the film who are not here this evening. I also want to thank Mrs. Heidi Ambrose, who's also not here from the Communist Party. She permitted us to use this room for this evening. I will, when I talk about permission to use a room, this is not normal in Austria anymore. There is a concentrated effort to erase Palestine from discussion in Vienna. And many places will not allow any discussion to take place. So we're very happy that we could, could have this evening here. I would also to like to ask uh, to thank Gunther Lorber, who does our, our uh, mailings, Magda Asem, who is a professional interpreter who offered to help us for people who have difficulty with the, with the English, Heidi and Eric Egera, who let us use their apartment for Jeff, <laughs> and Samuel Velba and Ursula Zadmeister, from the Women in Black for their transport here, transportation. But my special and personal thanks goes to Angela Valdek. I am completely touched by the amount of work and organization which she put into this evening. I have been sick most of the time, and she has done an incredible job in taking everything into her hands from the flyer, the invitation, the coordination. A lot of work goes into this, and especially as Jeff was traveling through Germany, um, it, it is a job which we are indebted to you, Angela. She even took me to the Christmas market. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to introduce Jeff now. I also met Jeff at a demonstration at the <laughs> Vesset. May I tell them what you said to me? 
Sure. Um, I hope, it was I don't at know. that time people were demonstrating. I think the Israeli, the Jewish Israelis wanted to throw Ahmed Tibi and who was the other one out of the Knesset. Um, Azmi Bashara, yeah. I think. And I and my naivety. Azmi, they succeeded. They did succeed. Yeah. Yeah. And I was very naive in those days, and I said, is this occupied territory? And he said, the whole place is occupied territory. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. <laughs> Jeff Halper is an author, lecturer, and political activist. He was born in the United States and came to Israel in 1973. He's the former director of a very important NGO, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, and is a co-founder of the People Yes Network. We are collecting for the committee, and we will pass around a box, and I hope people will give generously to this box the donations for Jeff, for Jeff's committee. He is now doing, you're not involved, so uh, you're no, not No, no, I'm still involved. You're no, still no, involved. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> Jeff's books include this book, which you can purchase at the back, War Against the People. Uh, it's about the Israelis, Palestinians, and the global classification of peoples. An Israeli in Palestine, Obstacles to Peace, Between re Redemption and Revival, Jeff Halper writes and speaks about Israeli politics and focuses mainly on nonviolent issues and strategies to solve what seems to be a hopeless, I, I don't even like to call it a conflict because it's not a conflict, it's an occupation. Um, and what is very important is he is a supporter of the BDS movement and the academic boycott of Israel and I'm proud to say we have a BDS Austria group now in Vienna. This is not easy work that they're doing here. The atmosphere is definitely very, very difficult. And that an Israeli is for BDS is something very special. Jeff co-founded ICAD in 1997 to resist the Israeli policy of demolishing Palestinian homes in the occupied territories. And he organized Israelis, Palestinians, and internationals to jointly rebuild Palestinian houses. He was nominated in 2006 for the Nobel Peace Prize with Ghassan Andoni um, by the American Friends Service Committee. I don't want to take a lot of time to talk. Uh, I already have. <laughs> but he has so many interesting things to tell us this evening that I think I'm going to shut up and give it to you. OK. Well, thank you, Paula and Angela and Gunther and all of you. This is my last performance <laughs> of a six-week tour. <laughs> you know, three weeks in Italy, my book came out in Italian, and then three weeks in Germany, um, and then here. So um, I, it's a blur, but if this is Tuesday, this must be Nuremberg, right? <laughs> I think. Um, <clears throat> So I'm actually not going to talk about Palestine. I'm not going to update tonight. Um, although that's a, I do do that, but you know, this is sort of another kind of an issue. But if Paula just mentioned BDS quickly, uh, I want to. Uh, I'm not just involved with BDS itself. In my, just this is a before we start the talk tonight. Uh, I think part of the problem we have, if Palestinians and Israelis together, and then all of you that support us, is that we don't have an end game. And you can't be in a political struggle without an end game. 
you know, we know the two-state solution is dead, but we haven't articulated, and certainly together, we haven't articulated where we're going. What, what, what are we BDSing for? What's our, what's our program? So I'm trying to work with a small group right now of Palestinians and Israelis um, to begin to formulate that kind of, um, of a plan and actually, it shouldn't be so difficult. I mean, there's not many options left. And of course, the main idea that we're working around is a binational democratic state in the entire country. One citizenship, one parliament. Um, in a sense, kind of going with the flow. Since Israel has already created one state, so OK, fine, we have that already. Now we simply have to transform that state from an apartheid regime into a democratic state of equal rights for all its citizens. So if we can begin to do that, I think that gives much more focus and direction to all our efforts um, you know, all over the world. So we're not there yet, but this is where in German, Although in German it's more BKS, but uh, you could say disinvestment. Um, you know, BDS for BDS is where I'd like us to go. Boycotts, investment, sanctions for, because that's what we're missing today, a democratic, a binational democratic state. So we can go back and talk about that in the questions and discussion afterwards if you want to, but I just thought I'd. I mentioned that. Now, let's start the evening with a, with a different kind of... A, a, well, let me just start this way. <clears throat> I've been active, you know, uh, fighting the occupation for the last 50 years, really. Um, and um, uh, either with the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions or in, in, different, uh, in different forms. And there were always two questions that nagged me in the back of, my, back of my mind for many of these years. One question was, is, why didn't Israel accept the two-state solution? 30 years ago, when the PLO offered it in 1988, actually even before 1988, but 1988 officially, why didn't Israel accept that? It's a super pro-Israeli solution to the conflict, although I agree with Paul, it's not really a conflict, it's a, a colonial situation, but uh, it's a pro-Israeli uh, solution. You know, as we know, all of us, there will be a Palestinian majority in this country, and yet the two-state solution leaves Israel on 78% of the country. And the Palestinians, if they get all of the occupied territories, are only getting 22%. So why wouldn't Israel accept that? Um, the other question that was in my mind was, how does Israel get away with this? In other words, here you have a brutal occupation of 50 years in a country on the southern border of Europe, that in many ways is in Europe. You know, Israel is a part of the European Football League. It's part of the European Basketball League. As a matter of fact, there have been times when Israel's been the European basketball champion. Uh, we're in the Eurovision contest, unfortunately. <laughs> so, you know, in many ways, uh, certainly Israel is in the neighborhood of NATO, in the neighborhood of the EU. Uh, it has special trade status with the EU. So here, in a semi-European country on the border of Europe, you have a brutal occupation of 50 years. That goes against, of course, the policies of the international community, which is for two states. Um, it violates dozens of UN resolutions, international law, human rights conventions. How does Israel get away with this? So these were the two questions in the back of my mind. And 
Over the years, I could never get to an answer to those questions by looking at what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. Looking down at the occupation, I couldn't really figure it out. So I thought, well, Israel succeeding uh, because of support that it gets from the international community. Why is it getting that support? So I thought, what if I looked up at Israel's place in the world? And when you do that, a whole different kind of a picture begins to emerge. You know, we look at, we, Israel presents itself as this little Jewish victim boy in a tough neighborhood, you know, besieged by Arab Muslim terrorists. Uh, and that's certainly the narrative that you hear in Germany all the time, and probably here as well. Well, when you look at Israel's place in the world in terms of its military and security relationships with almost every country in the world, what you begin to see is Israel is small, true, but it's really it's, it's on the border of being a superpower. In the sense that uh, it's uh, the fourth largest nuclear power in the world. So at a time when everybody's upset about North Korea and Iran, they don't have really nuclear weapons and the ways to deliver them, Israel has more than 200 nuclear warheads and multiple ways of delivering. And in fact, what's really interesting, you know, Israel's kind of a rogue state in a nuclear sense, because Israel's policy uh, is called officially nuclear ambiguity. We're not telling people how many nuclear warheads we have, if we have them, this or that. But why do we have nuclear weapons? It's really a form of extortion, because they're not to be used, I mean, Israel might use some tactical nuclear weapons on Iran. That's certainly possible. Not an atomic bomb, but a tactical nuclear weapon. Israel has threatened to use it against Egypt. One small tactical nuclear bomb on the Aswan Dam would wipe out Egypt, pretty much. But it's not really that. It really has to do with um, uh, what, is, what we know in Israel as Samson syndrome. And the idea is that it's a kind of extortion against the international community. You know, Europe, Austria, certainly, is within the zone of Israeli nuclear weapons. Israel has intercontinental ballistic weapons called the Jericho series of weapons that are capable of, of delivering nuclear bombs or nuclear warheads almost throughout all of Europe, a good part of Africa, Asia, Iran is easily within, within that circle. You know? And the idea is that if Israel finds its back to the wall, if Israel feels that it's in an existential danger, It'll use its nuclear weapons. And the ambiguity is, we're not saying in what direction. You know? These aren't necessarily aimed at Iran or at Egypt. They could be aimed at Austria. It could be aimed, in other words, it's really kind of a, of a threat hanging over the international community. And here's a country with nuclear weapons that a good part of the world is within the range, and they're willing to use them. I mean, what is an existential threat? The Israeli army has said the Jordan River, the Jordan Valley, is Israel's security border. That, I mean, they've said that actually since 1948, not only since 1967. That's an absolute. Well, what if the international community really forced Israel with international pressures to get out of the occupied territory entirely 
in order to allow a Palestinian state to emerge. If Israel had to get out of the Jordan Valley, would it consider that an existential threat? According to Israeli military doctrine, yes. And that could trigger some kind of a nuclear attack. So, so you know, this whole issue of, um, of international support for Israel isn't always a matter of, of, of support for Israel. There's a lot of fear in terms of what Israel is capable of doing militarily as a kind of a rogue state. Because in many ways, and Israel shows this all the time, it doesn't give a shit. Israel doesn't care. I mean, Israel's now in the process of demolishing homes and uh, cisterns and solar panels and institutions built by the European Union and by European countries in the West Bank. Doesn't care. So, so this whole issue of, um, of Israel's role in the world in a military security way is really a part of the whole conflict that we haven't really taken into account. And this has to do with what I call globalizing Palestine. Now, <clears throat> this is part, this is all part of what I call security politics. One of the interesting things, I think it reveals a lot, well, one reason why I wrote this book <laughs> was because this whole issue of weapons, security, and so on, is not on the agenda of the left. We don't know anything about this world. And I, I put myself at the top of the list. I wrote a book about something I know nothing about. I couldn't tell you a howitzer from a tank. It's not my field, I'm not interested in it. But at the same time, one thing I discovered was that you know today the military and internal security and police are really the same package. More and more and more they're intertwined in their weapons and their tactics and their uniforms in what they do internally, externally. Well, if you take the military and security and police globally all over the world, it's a two and a half trillion euro a year industry. A trillion I learned is a billion in German. Two and a half trillion dollar a year industry. So besides the power of weapons that I really didn't know anything about, what do I know about nano weapons? You know, one of the problems we have in the left, I think, is that most of us, not all, but most of us, come from the social sciences or the humanities. We don't know what these scientists are cooking up in their labs. You know, you get 25-year-old uh, 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 chemists and uh, uh, computer people and all, you know, in, in labs funded by, by defense industries with, with billions of dollars to develop these mad weapons, you know, we don't know what they're developing. And they don't really have, they haven't studied social sciences and humanities. So they don't have any ethical concerns. For them, they're making a lot of money. It's a lot of fun. And there's that whole, there's that, that bridge. We don't know what they're cooking up. I mean, I, I can explain it tonight, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Some of this is going to sound like science fiction to us. <clears throat> But it really isn't. And then, of course, you got the money. I mean, how can you understand the way the world works when you're missing a piece that's two and a half trillion euros big? So this is a huge blind spot, I think, in our political map. And that's one reason why I wanted to, to begin to write about this. So. It has to do with what I call security politics. You know, we're used to looking at politics in kind of a common sense sort of a way. You know, our country has friends, it has allies, it has enemies. 
But when you put two and a half trillion euros into the picture, it changes things quite a bit. So let me give you a couple examples of what I mean. Focusing on Israel. Israel is useful. Now, I'm not saying that Israel is the only act. I mean, Israel is not the United States. The United States puts 70% of the new weapons every year in the world are come from our America. And it's not at that level. But Israel is a small country, and we'll talk about it in a minute, and fills some very important niches, especially in what I call war against the people. But it's, it's sometimes more useful to follow a small country, because a small country has to scramble. And it reveals all the cracks and the, and the niches in the defense industries and in international politics that you wouldn't see if you're following a major power. So looking at the world from an Israeli perspective is, is pretty instructive. So what do I mean by security politics changing international relations? Well, we all know that, that Israel is very connected to the United States. As a matter of fact, most of us think that Israel is a client of the United States. It gets three and a half billion dollars a year in military aid, but more important, it has privileged access to American military technology. And that's really what gives Israel the edge, more than Europe gives Israel an edge in developing weapon systems because of that privileged access, including the development of joint weapons and, and, and projects and so on. Uh, not to mention the political cover that, is, that the United States gives Israel. Israel, of course, is also very close to Europe, to every European country. One of the things it's doing is the Europe, the EU, is developing its own drone. A drone for surveillance, but a weaponized drone that can also attack, called the Watchkeeper. And the Watchkeeper drone is an Israeli drone. That's being developed with Talis and BAE, uh, BAE in England, uh, and so on. So that Israel is very involved in all kinds of joint projects with the EU, including what's called Horizon 2020, which is the EU's funding of research and development, in Israel's case, of a lot of weapon systems. So the EU is directly involved in helping Israel develop weapons. Um, and then, uh, I haven't looked into Austria in particular. I don't think Austria is a major player. Germany certainly is. Uh, and, uh, but, but, you know, you can go to every country, through every country and explain how Israel is working with that country in terms of military security police. Okay. Uh, there's nothing really earth-shattering in this news. But Israel is seen as a client of the U.S., um, a part of uh, the global north. But look what happens when you look at the map. Turns out that Israel is the number two or three largest arms supplier to China. Whoa, that's kind of interesting. I mean, China is the arch rival of the, of the United States and, uh, and Europe. You know, it's leading the BRICS counter block of counter hegemons. The United States is moving its whole a, 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 a sixth fleet into the South Pacific in order to contain China. So here is America's most loyal ally. We love America. America loves us. Netanyahu is speaking in Congress every three weeks. <laughs> That's supplying China, not only with weapons. What's, more, what's really impressive here is that Israel doesn't build big weapon systems. It doesn't build, it builds tanks, but it doesn't really export them very much. It doesn't export jet fighters, it doesn't export battleships, patrol boats, but not, not, in other words, to be the number two or three largest arms supplier to China, which has the largest military in the world, 
you have to be selling a lot of stuff. And you're not and if you're not selling the big expensive things like ships and tanks and airplanes, to be the number two or three when you're selling components of weapon systems, high-tech systems, shows how deep you're penetrating into the Chinese military and even into internal Chinese security in order to get to that level of, of commerce in, in, in arms. The largest arms supply to China is Russia. And look, Israel is the number two, three, four, depending on the year, largest arms supplier to India, the second largest military in the world, uh, <clears throat> and also a key member of the BRICS bloc. So all of a sudden, alliances aren't quite what they look like. You know, and alliances shift. So people ask me sometimes, what would Israel do if the United States abandoned it? I think the question is the opposite. <laughs> I think the minute Israel feels that there's a shift towards China, it's gonna, it could drop the United States. And, 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 and or what Israel is good at doing, it doesn't have to do that. Because within security politics, it includes using local communities. I mean, it's interesting. All right, you have the APEC, you have the Jewish community in the United States that supports Israel. So that explains a lot of American support. You've got the, the evangelicals. Um, okay, but what explains support in Germany? Okay, guilt over the Holocaust to some degree. Although I don't know if that's really the basis of German foreign policy. But how do you explain Brazil, or Nigeria, or India, or China, or countries that don't have a Jewish community? Don't have uh, Christian Zionists? You know, what's going on? In other words, if you're looking for a more universal explanation for Israel's support, it's, you can't go country by country. You have to look at something more universal, and I would suggest that that's the military security relationship that Israel has. That, in fact, is a quid pro quo. We will serve the hegemons, we Israelis. The hegemons could be the United States and Europe, or counter-hegemons like uh, China, India, Nigeria, or local warlords. I mean, anybody that has power. For example, Israel's very involved with the militias in southern Sudan, with all kinds of warlords in the Congo, where it has massive uh, commercial interests, Angola, and different places. So it's not, in, uh, there's, uh, there's a company of a guy named Yair Klein, who's a, one of the most famous Israeli mercenaries and arms dealers, uh, and you've had Israelis hired uh, by the Colombian military, by the Colombian paramilitaries, including their death squads, and by the drug cartels. There have been times when you've had pitched battles with Israeli advisors on all sides. <laughs> so, their penetration is very deep into countries. I'll come back to that in a second. So, okay, you've got all that. Look at security politics in the Middle East. We used to talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict. Remember that? Well, now there's a love affair between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Not to mention Israel and Egypt. Israel has explicitly sided with the Sunnis in the Sunni Shia civil war. And and uh, you know, and that's helped. I'd go a step further. Now I might this might be completely overstating it, but I think there's something to what I'm saying. I would argue that Israel has become the leader of the Sunni Muslim world. <laughs> you know? Because countries like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and so Turkey even, uh, cannot do anything about Iran and the Shiites without Israel. 
I mean, Saudi Arabia is the largest importer of weapons in the world, and yet it can't beat the Houthis in Yemen on its own. So, so the, the Sunni world needs Israel. It needs Israel both because of its contacts to the U.S. that helps because Saudi Arabia is not the most popular country in America, but also because, again, of its military ties and its military prowess. Um, so that you've got here now, today, in the Middle East, a complete reversal of things, where Israel is, is, is actually, uh, like I would, I would actually claim, is one of the leaders of the Sunni world, if not the leader. Um, look, Israel's 25% of Israelis' armed trade is in sub-Saharan Africa. That's not military. That's mainly security and policing. Training the special operations units of different dictators. For example, in Equatorial Guinea, where Israel is very strong, uh, training uh, the presidential guard, training your security forces, and so on. Israel is very strong in Brazil. An Israeli company was hired to secure the Olympics, which was like a, a, a $2 billion contract. And that gives you tremendous resources to develop your security industry. It's like a laboratory to, 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 to protect the Olympics. But there's other things as well. For example, Israel has helped Brazil establish what's called the Pacification Police. That's what they're called. There's a new police unit in Rio and, and Sao Paulo to pacify the favelas. That's called the pacification police units that are getting help, uh, advice, training, weaponry from Israel. So basically, I can go country by country, virtually every country, even countries Israel doesn't have trade relations with, and explain to you what the, what the relationship is. How Israel is delivering for the ruling elites in every country. But there's a bigger, there's a bigger story here as well. And that is transnational capitalism. We all live, all of us, in one global capitalist system. And it's a system in crisis. It's a system that is, that's, that's facing real challenges of sustainability and inequality and conflict. I don't have to get into this too much because we all know this here, but we all know that there are few firms that control the global economy. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, Oxfam did a study a couple years ago where, in fact, it's not just a slogan, 1% of the world's population owns 50% of the world's resources. Most of the people of this world are known, especially by corporations, as surplus humanity. 80% 80 80 of the people live on less than 10 euros a day in the world. But more than that, they will never, ever, ever be a part of the capitalist system. They'll never be educated to a meaningful degree. They'll never be integrated in a productive way, the way capitalist means productive, beyond subsistence, into the capitalist economy. And worse, <laughs> worse sin, they'll never be consumers. So they're excluded, basically. There's no place for them. But it's not only these people of the Global South, it's also some of the young people here, more likely your children or your grandchildren, since it's, this is an older audience, um, in the Global North. You know, you have the Occupy Movement. You've got, you know, more and more young people in the Global North are excluded or, or increasingly excluded from the capitalist system. There's been many researches that show that young people today will not achieve the standard of living of their parents. 
Not to mention job security. And I think one reason why we don't have young people, maybe here tonight or, or in general that active, is because they're so insecure. I mean, they gotta worry so much about getting a job, and what kind of a job, and that they don't have the mental space for politics and for, uh, for, all, for all of this. So the world is closing down on them as well. We know about the scarcity of resources in the world, uh, that w wars today tend to be resource wars, where the, some of the most valuable resources are under the feet of the world's poorest people. And we know that about 70% of the world's resources are channeled into the global north every year. So you've got that, and the resources are getting scarcer and scarcer since they're finite. And that creates a whole situation of, of what I call, well, not me, actually, there's uh, different researchers that have called this an everywhere war. An everywhere war. And it's a war for securitization. You know, how's this for a German word? This is a, a, a securocratic war. It's a war to secure the planet, the resources, the populations, and so on for the capitalist, for the capitalist elite. Um, and it's a war that's fought, it's interesting, fought in global, uh, in global battle space. Um, <clears throat> This is a term that the military and police share today. You don't talk about battlefields anymore. That's an old concept, a contained place where armies meet and fight. But militaries and police forces talk about battle space. With terrorism, with crime, with immigrants, and so on. So this neighborhood here is as much a part of the battle space as Afghanistan. So the war is an everywhere war, wherever capitalism feels uh, threatened. And the, and the, the, um, the bottom line, the, the goal of this everywhere war is pacification. And that's a term, now it's a problematic term because it can mean something positive as well. You know, you pacify a baby. <laughs> so you're doing pacification. But pacification, I mean pacification in the sense, of course, of repressing populations to a point where they can't resist. The Spanish and Portuguese called their colonization of the New World pacification. You know, the Americans had a pacification campaign against the Native Americans. In Vietnam, there was a pacification campaign. The French had pacification campaigns uh, in Algeria and in Indochina. So it's a term with a military security history. And it's a term that I think we should be using more. And I'll come back to that because it's a much better, more political and critical term than the term security. That is a term that's much more useful for the, the powers that be to use. We'll come, we'll come back to that. Now, this is, this is interesting. Just to go a little bit more into, into, into some depth. And I'm getting back to Israel at, <laughs> at some point. When we think about war, <clears throat> we think really about conventional interstate war. Um, you know, armies fight each other, tanks, jet planes, battleships, navies. Um, countries fight each other in wars. And that's the kind of war that the Na NATO, your defense ministry, the Pentagon are geared to fight. NATO and the Pentagon are fully prepared to fight the Soviet Union. You know, that's, that's, who, they're, that's who they're fighting. Even though there is no more Soviet Union. That wasn't a, a mistake. Um, <clears throat> in other words, the kinds of weapons 
that are being produced today are weapons for conventional wars. But the last major conventional war was World War II. That was the last time two major military powers fought each other, was World War II. There's been a few localized episodic wars, interstate wars since, of course, the Arab-Israeli wars, the Iran-Iraq war, Falkland Islands was a cute little war. But no war in which two major powers have fought each other since World War II. So in a way, this kind of war is fairly, uh, is fairly gone, fairly irrelevant. Wars today take the form of what I call war against the people. War against the people in the name of securitizing everything. Wars take two forms in particular today. And, you know, we use this term asymmetrical war. Uh, one form of war is basically against the global south. And there's a million word, uh, terms for these kinds of wars. I'm not going to translate all the German for you guys. But, uh, you know, there's high intensity operations, uh, limited wars, small wars, irregular wars, military operations, police operations, military operations short of war, um, new wars, resource wars, climate wars, uh, 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 peacekeeping operations, which are a form of war, counterinsurgency, guerrilla wars, um, uh, low intensity conflicts. I mean, there's, uh, <laughs> you can go on and on with the different terms that are basically terms of war against the peoples of the global south. And the second form of warfare, major form today, is, is war against the people of the global north, against us in the global north. And that uh, um, expresses itself in security, internal security, homeland security, uh, and, uh, and policing, a militarized policing. The goal in the global north is to create what you already have in the global south, basically, and that is security states. Security states are states in which security, if I can use the term, trumps oh, no. <laughs> uh, democracy. Security becomes the way in which you organize the society, and of course the security forces uh, have authority uh, more than they would normally have in a democracy. Uh, one of the ways towards a security state is uh, declaring a permanent states of permanent states of emergency. Like France, today is living under a permanent state of emergency. So is England. So is the United States with the Patriot Act since since 9/11. And that, of course, gives the security forces more authority than you would have normally in a democracy. And that leads into a security state. And that's a concept that Israel is really peddling in the world. Israel, that's part of its security politics. The more we can make you look like us and have the same preoccupations about security and terrorism and, and, and being insecure, the more you'll identify with us. The more we create a common, you know, uh, every time there's a terrorist attack anywhere, Israel says, ah, now you know how we feel. You see, there's that. And you know where it got its, its, its most amazing expression? A, a year and a half ago, a year and a half ago, there were the bombings in Brussels. The Israeli government did not say, these were sorry, you know, condolences. What they said was to the Belgians, 
The Israeli government said, stop eating Belgian chocolate and join the world. That one. And what they said to the Belgians was something like this. I can back up a minute. Said, you Belgians, or French, or whoever, criticize us Israelis for having an occupation. But you shouldn't be criticizing us, you should be imitating us. Because look what we've done. We have one country here. We have a country I mean, you're, you have a problem with a few Muslims in a neighborhood in, in Brussels? Look what we have. We have a whole country in which our people are living under a vibrant democracy. We have a flourishing economy. Our people feel a great sense of personal security. In a country where half the population are terrorists. Meaning, of course, Palestinians. Well, if we can do that in a country where half the population are terrorists, imagine what we could do for you. So adopt our models, adopt our training, adopt our weapons, adopt our tactics. You know, because you're really, you're really little Israels that, that you know, and we have to, you know, once you figure that out, you'll begin to see that we're actually the model, that we're the leaders, that, that what we're doing is positive. So this is part of the security politics. Um, what I'm arguing here is that, again, NATO and the Pentagon don't fight wars against the people. They try sometimes. They haven't done very well in Afghanistan, <laughs> in Iraq, in Somalia, in Mali. I mean, wherever you go, they haven't done well because their weapons and their tactics are not, ta are not are, are of conventional warfare. It doesn't work against the people. I would suggest that this whole area of asymmetrical war against the people, this whole area here, is an Israeli niche. I'm not saying Israel is the only country that, that, uh, that produces these kinds of weapons and tactics, but this is really the Israeli niche. Because Israel has been fighting a war against the people for a hundred years already. A war against the Palestinian people. So it has, it has the tactics and the weaponry uh, and the models of population control and the idea of a security state in general that, that are effective in terms of fighting this kind of a war. So if I would go back to my first questions in a minute, first of all, why didn't Israel accept the two-state solution? I would argue that, in fact, we have to look at the occupied territory as a resource for Israel. This is a laboratory. This is where you develop weapons, security systems, surveillance systems, um, again, models of population control, uh, and that's what gives you the edge in the market. I mean, not many countries have a laboratory of millions of people that they can experiment on. In my book, for example, I list all the new weapons that were tested in Gaza in 2014. Um, and Israel, in fact, is keeping intentionally a kind of a low-level conflict going with the Palestinians that on the one hand doesn't endanger Israel, but it creates a level of violence that allows Israel to justify checkpoints, to use surveillance techniques, and, and it, can, it can manage, you know, it can control, it can raise the level or lower the level. And that's what happens in Gaza. When it wants to test weapon systems, it raises the level. And, and, it, and it, it's a very controlled laboratory um, in the occupied territories. And I would say, for security politics, Israel gets two things out of the occupation. Uh, the, you know, not just the weapons, but the high-tech you know, high-tech technology, our toys, 
our iPhones and all that stuff, that's all military technology. Our toys are the byproducts of that. These are all coming, you know, GPS was developed to guide uh, missiles to targets. Later on, it helps you find where the party is tonight. You know, but this is all byproducts. So, in fact, Israel, that's known as a startup nation, right, benefits not only from its military exports, but from all the, all the byproducts and high tech, biomedicine and, 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 and computer technologies, and, you know, some of the most checkpoint. Checkpoint is an Israeli military company. Based, I mean, it's a private company of people that came out of the military that, that invented firewalls in your computer. The USB, you know, you can do BDS all you want. <laughs> your USB is an Israeli invention coming out of, uh, out of the military. So there's a lot of, of, of spin-offs of this in an economic sense. And of course, the more a country delivers to other countries in terms of security and power, the more political clout it has. And that's what allows Israel then to sit at the table with the big boys. So I would argue that the reason it didn't give up the occupation has more to do with the laboratory than it does with any kind of religious or national a, a, a kind of considerations. And the second question, how does Israel get away with it? is security politics. That quid pro quo will deliver to you in all kinds of ways, whoever you are as a ruling elite, and in return you let us keep the occupation. You can criticize us here and there, that's fine, but no sanctions. And that's, that's exactly the situation we have. So, let me just take another couple minutes and go down and say, what are, what do I mean by weapons of wars against the people? What do these weapons look like? There's a lot. I'll just take a couple of examples to give you an idea. Drones. Israel is the world's leader in the manufacturing of drones and drone technology. 60% of the world's drones are Israeli. Uh, <clears throat> why? Why Israel? Well, Europe and the U.S. don't have the technology to do drones? I'll tell you why. Because weapons reflect your concept of war. The Americans and the Europeans, I can jump back, are fighting conventional wars. In a conventional war of armies and air forces and artillery, a drone is a stupid weapon. What does a drone do? It sits in the air. It sits there for days and weeks and months. It sits and sits and sits. It does work that a pilot can never do. Surveying, watching, once in a while attacking if it's weaponized. And that's what a drone does. It's easy to shoot down. Any country that has, any little country that has an air force, can shoot down a drone. It's a sitting duck, as we say in English. So the Americans and the Europeans are saying, why would we invest money in an airplane you can shoot down? That's stupid. But Israel is fighting a war against the people. And the people don't have an air force. They can't shoot down a drone. People of Gaza can't shoot down drones. They can't even see the drones that attack them. They attack in what's called over-the-horizon uh, types of, of, of attack systems, where you don't actually have to even see the target to, to attack it. So, that, so drones are perfect weapons in a war against the people, because they control, they watch, they survey, they record, they can attack. So, so you see the very, the very technologies that, I mean, the, the fact that Israel has developed this, this weapon that's today proving so useful is because it's fighting a different kind of war than the big powers have 
and it's cornered the market. This is, this is an Israeli niche. Even the American drones have a lot of Israeli uh, uh, components. They're, they're, they're based to some degree on Israeli models. And what's significant about drones today is that most drones are sold to police forces and not to militaries. So that's something to ponder for a couple minutes. Uh, tanks. So uh, what we'll see, you know, what we see all down the line is the coming together, the merging of military police weapons. They're, they're coming together just like the military and the police are starting to come together. So this is a version of the Merkava tank, which is an Israeli tank, but it's called, it's called the LIC. LIC, you know what that stands for? Low Intensity Conflict. That's Gaza. That's the occupation. That's uh, what goes on in Latin America, that goes on in Asia, low intensity conflicts. And these are kind of tanks that are, that are designed for urban warfare. Today, for the first time in history, the majority of human beings live in cities. And armies have always avoided cities. They're a mess. Even in Baghdad, uh, when the Americans went in, was a mess for them. Armies avoid cities. Well, you can't really avoid cities anymore in wars, especially wars against the people, because that's where the people are. And so developing weapons of urban warfare is another part of the Israeli, of the Israeli um, niche. You have Gaza, but not only Gaza. Israel has built a whole Arab city in the Negev. And it's called sometimes Balad. <laughs> sometimes it's called Chicago for some reason. I don't know why. I guess for Israelis, the, the idea of, of violence is Chicago. <laughs> um, and it's for, sim it's for simulating urban warfare. It's where American troops go before they go to Iraq and Afghanistan. So urban warfare and its weaponry is another niche we can talk about. Walls, fortified borders, are certainly another niche in the war against the people, based on controlling the Palestinians, of course. You have walls. But Europe, <laughs> this is a growth industry in Europe. There's no border in Europe that doesn't have Israeli components to it. Uh, and let me give you one little example of security politics. Greece. Okay? Cyprus, the leftist, right? I mean, a leftist leftist. Prime Minister of Greece was our hero when Greece went to fight the EU and Merkel over austerity and Greece was the, you know, defying the EU and all this stuff, and Cyprus is our hero. At that same time, he went to Israel, where he bought millions of euros of fences, uh, uh, fortified border uh, components, sensors, weapons, in order to fortify the border with Turkey against the refugees coming in. And when he was in Jerusalem, he declared, Cyprus the leftist, declared that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of the, of the Jewish people. So we talk about a quid pro quo. I mean, that's a pretty obvious, a pretty obvious exchange, that kind of a thing. And these are just some of the borders in the world that are securitized. So this certainly gives Israel uh, uh, you know, and again, Israel is one of the go-to places for walls. I mean, Trump was talking about Israeli walls all the time. And Elbit Systems is involved in, in the wall or the smart fence in, in, on the border of Mexico, but in many, many other, in India, and in many other places as well. 
Part of fortified borders, of course, are weaponized borders. So all around Gaza, you have these sentry towers loaded with all kinds of cameras and surveillance devices. Israel can cover every inch of Gaza to the sea in terms of surveillance. You can't move without Israel surveying you. But they're also weaponized. You know, now, this is a remote weapon system, which means you have soldiers in Tel Aviv and other places with screens that are, that are monitoring and decide when to shoot. Uh, if Palestinians get too close, there's a buffer zone. And Palestinians have no idea how wide the buffer zone is between the Israeli border and where they can farm. Is it 150 meters? Is it 300 meters? And it changes all the time. And if you happen to get in that range, you get shot. There's no, there's no negotiations here. This is a, a, a remote weapon system. What Israel is also working on, and this is even, this is something we should keep in mind, is autonomous weapon systems. There's technologies today based on algorithms in which you don't need human beings to sit behind a screen and, and, and decide. You, you feed into the computer that runs the gun the parameters. So you say uh, a target is a man with a beard, uh, dressed in robes, uh, 10 or more of them together with some white pickup trucks around. And that's the target. And an autonomous weapon system will shoot those targets, plus, of course, anybody else that's around. The collateral damage, it's called. And Jeremy Scahill figures that something like 90% of the casualties of drones are civilians, are, are not targeted. But now, autonomous weapons are illegal in international law because there's no accountability. If a weapons society who to shoot, who do you hold accountable? I mean, you've got to have human control. Israel is trying very much to change that law. It's, it's, it's working very hard to get this autonomous weapon uh, uh, industry. And, and Europe is actually resisting. Um, the Belgians, for example, are resisting the idea of the security state. So it's not that Israel has, you know, it's resonating, but not everybody's buying it right now. But these are the technologies that exist and that can easily be used. Autonomous weapon systems. And of course, that translates into the checkpoints. There's 600 checkpoints in the West Bank. Uh, inside the West Bank, you know, there's only about 17 between Israel and the occupied, and the, on the Green Line. You know, 90 some percent are inside the West Bank, you know, uh, uh, controlling Palestinian movement. Well, you got millions of Palestinians going through. These are mini laboratories. Every Israeli surveillance company has, has people there. And some Palestinians get magnets, and you test bi biometrics. Israel is the world's leader in biometrics. There's facial recognition, body recognition, voice recognition systems. Well, no wonder Israel is the world's leader in airport security. You know, Israel might be, I don't know, the Vienna airport could be very well be secured by Israel. I don't know. But that's one reason, because this is another niche that Israel has security. You want to secure your airport, who are you going to go to? And, and totalized urban surveillance systems as well. Um, many cities in, in the world are starting to buy... Uh, this system, this system comes from a company called Nice Systems. How's that for <laughs> marketing? Um, nice Systems has a whole surveillance uh, system, and here is where you get algorithms. Here is where you really don't need an operator watching screens, but algorithms become very much into urban security. 
And it leads to what's called preventive, preventive crime detection, which doesn't mean what it used to mean. It means that we have algorithms of, of profiles of people that are going to commit different kinds of crimes. And we can apprehend those people before they commit the crimes. That's why Israel is always having, you see, every night they hunt for suspects. They arrest suspects. If, you know, if you read the news, that's what, you know, they're not people that have done things. People that, are, that have the potential for doing things. And that's already enough in security. Because the whole idea of security is to prevent uh, an action. And if the security forces in a security state have that kind of detention power that they wouldn't have in a normal democracy, you can have those kinds of algorithmic totalizing urban systems that the police go by rather than your civil liberties. I mean, this is a direct threat to the concept of civil liberties. What they, what they target these systems, the algorithms, is any, any person or situation that's abnormal, that's exceptional, that's out of the ordinary. And that's what sends up the signals to, uh, to, to, to monitor. Just one interesting thing, if you take the surveillance industry, which is a multi-billion euro industry, of the 528 companies in the world, 510 of them are in the global north. So, and Israel is one of the five top companies, uh, countries with the, the, a, surve a surveillance uh, industry. So it gets pretty clear who's watching who in the world. Now, war against the people again is much, much more has to do with internal security and policing than it does with the military. You know, the, I think that's, you know, we tend to look at the military because that's most dramatic. It's large scale, you have sexy weapons. But it's actually the police and the security forces that are the, the main forces in wars against the people. Um, and here's where, again, you see the weapons coming together. The Uzi submachine gun is, a, is an Israeli, one of the, the, maybe the most famous Israeli weapon. Um, it's, the most fa it's the most used submachine gun in the world by police forces, by militaries, by guards, security guards, and by criminals. Uh, well, it used to be a gun that you held like this, you know, with two hands. Now, the, the Israel weapons industry, IWI, is producing for law enforcement, not for militaries. An Uzi submachine gun that's like a pistol. So now when your cops, I mean, maybe not so much in Austria, I don't know, but certainly if you're in Tennessee <laughs> and the cop pulls you over, he could very easily be pulling out a submachine gun from his pocket instead of, in, in, instead of a pistol. And weapons against the people are also uh, weapons we don't think about or, or we don't take seriously. A whole huge industry, and Israel pioneers this industry partly, is non-lethal weapons. That's how they're, mar that they're marketed. Tear gases, crowd control sprays, um, all kinds of chemical agents um, that are supposed to be non-lethal. Now, they're not really non-lethal because you can die. If you have asthma, or you're a baby, or an old person, or whatever, you can die. They're, they're, they're fairly, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever had a whiff of tear gas, but it's pretty strong stuff. Um, but it's sold as non-lethal, and that's what allows police forces to use it. You see, a police force can go to the mayor and say, look, you know, this is non-lethal. Uh, you know, it's not a problem. Um, but in fact, in fact, uh, uh, you know, these are very lethal kinds of weapons, and they're weapons of, of crowd control. And to tell you the honest truth, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say this. I don't know. Um, I think sometimes we fall into this trap. I'll give you an example of the laboratory. Belin. 
mean, I don't want to take away at all from the, the courage and the persistence of the, of the Palestinians and internationals and Israelis that go to Benin every week. This village in the West Bank where the, to fight the wall that's encro encroaching on their, on their lands. And it's become very famous every, every week. And there's a movie, Five Broken Cameras, you know, and, and the problem with it is that it's been going on for years and it's become ritualized. Now, 10 o'clock every Friday morning, the Israeli army knows that there's going to be a bunch of uh, Palestinians, Israelis, internationals coming down the road to protest, and they're ready. And it's not that they're ready, but they're, they experiment with all kinds of crowd control, sprays and gases and materials and so on. And you actually have representatives of companies that are there, and other armies. For example, I've talked personally to a guy from the American army who specializes in crowd control that goes to Belin to learn. Because it's like, a, you know, instead of hiring students <laughs> and giving them gas masks and experimenting on it, you, could, you, could, you have a, a, a whole crowd that's going to come like clockwork every week that you can experiment on. One of the fellows in Belin, one of the Palestinians, has collected more than a hundred canisters of all kinds of different materials that have been thrown at the, uh, at the protesters. So, you know, in a way where, I, you know, we're kind of trapped in a sense. You know, you have to protest and resist, but at the same time, when you do that within a laboratory, you're in, 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 a, in a weird sort of a way contributing to, to, uh, to the industry of, of crowd control. Drones for in a, in, a, in, a, in a minute. Drones on another level are also used for security. Micro drones. These are a specialty of the Technion, which is Israel's Polytechnic University. It's often been called the laboratory of the Israeli army. Uh, and as a matter of fact, all over the world, uh, there's BDS campaigns about the Technion. The Technion has relations, I'm sure, with universities in Austria. And that's a really good BDS target because it's so militarized on the one hand, but it also involves students. I mean, it's, direct, it's in my campus, in my classroom, you know, and, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a way of really connecting students to the BDS campaign. How is this for a drone? Cute. <laughs> but it's pretty deadly. These are surveillance cameras. You know, and very powerful surveillance cameras that, can, that are connected to a database. So, you know, th and this is more police forces, the security forces that would use a weapon like this. I mean, the military could use it as well, but they have other, other forms. This is more... Uh, more attuned to urban type of warfare. So you've got a whole surveillance system here, but very sophisticated and tied in to the same database as that big urban uh, surveillance system we saw before. But look at this. This can be either poisons or, uh, or diseases. And here we start getting into nanotechnologies and nanoweapons which is another niche of Israel. Um, I'll talk about it in a minute, but what you can do today is take a disease like botulism. Botulism is a disease that doesn't have an antidote. An, an antidote. And <clears throat> you can put botulism, this, in, in, a, in a nano form. You can reduce it, compress it to, to a nano form. This much botulism can kill 100,000 people, you know? So this little tiny drone is in many ways as powerful as a, as a nuclear bomb. Um, the Technion also specializes in weaponizing insects through micro technologies. So you can take an actual insect 
and make it into a spy, uh, in, into a surveillance device. So the next time you, you hit a mosquito, be careful you're not killing a 10,000 euro machine or something. And then we get into nanoweapons as well. I won't get into this, but Israel, Germany, the United States, and China are the major uh, uh, countries that specialize in military applications of nanotechnology. Now, nanotechnology, we know, has a, has a benign um, image because it's so, it's so known in biomedicine, because it's so small. But imagine weapons that are nano-sized. A nano is a billionth of a meter. If you take a strand of hair, I can't demonstrate, <laughs> but if you took a strand of hair, a piece of hair, it's a hundred nanos wide. A nano weapon is 10 nanos wide. In other words, it's a tenth of the width of a hair. That's how small a nano weapon can be. And you can load it with, with poisons, with diseases, or with different kinds of materials. Now, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. This is going to happen within the next 10 or 15 years, though. I mean, the technologies are, very, are, are, are developing very quickly. Uh, um, but you can have these nano weapons, and, the, and you can load them up with these materials. But the idea is that a nanobot, one of these little nano weapons, can self-replicate. That's one of the that's one of the the uh, the, the, the um, features of nanotechnology. They can self-replicate. So one nanobot can produce a billion within within a, within a few days. See, so they self-replicate, um, and you can also load them with artificial intelligence. Not yet. We're still not there, but this is in the next few years. So you could say to a nano weapon, kill everybody in Vienna over the age of 40. And by looking at DNA and all kinds of other characteristics, the, 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 the weapon itself can figure out how to do that. So we're looking at, and we don't know, I, I mean, I can't, I'm not an expert on nano weapons either. There's a new book about nano weapons that's that's interesting that I can. It's called Nano Weapons in English if you want to look it up. But it's it's a it's a really uh, I mean it's a it's a technology much more powerful than nuclear technology. To be a, a a nano weapon country is much more powerful than being a nuclear country. In fact, this it sounds weird, but it's it's true. When nano weapons are developed, you could send a nano <laughs> underwater against a nuclear submarine. And by replicating, and if you, if you load it up with a corrosive material, it could eat the submarine and the nuclear weapons within a short period of time. So these are weapons in a way more powerful and this, just to, I'm not going to get into this too much, but although these are things we should start to know, there was a study done, and they asked some, some, some uh, I don't get the whole thing, some leading scientists, what's the probability that human beings will be extinct by the year 2100? Which isn't that long from now. And the scientists figured about 20% probability. And they said, how? Now, we think about nuclear weapons. We think about global change. Climate, global warming as, as the way we're going to go. But if you look at, the, at what the scientists came up with, five out of the eight major reasons that would cause human extinction have to do with nanotechnology. Uh, you know, so uh, this is a whole area. I mean, this is like super war against the people. 
Because a, a population doesn't know it's being attacked. You know, you could put botulism in, a, in, in the water supply of a city, uh, in, in a nano sense, and people wouldn't even know. Or you can attack an entire population. You know, nano weapons can target uh, your nervous system, it can target different parts of the brain. I mean, nano weapons, you know, are. And we're getting to a point now. A lot of scientists talk about what's called the singularity. Some of you have heard of that. Uh, and that is they're estimating that in the year 2045, which again, this isn't so long from now, a lot of us will be around, some of you will be around. Um, in 2045, the artif artificial intelligence of nanobots, computers, weapon systems, and so on, will surpass that of human beings. It will be in an age where these machines are smarter than we are. And then the question is, now what do you do? do you, can you keep control? And it sounds science fiction -y and crazy, but there is an actual discussion in the Pentagon in the United States about building nano walls. In other words, the only way to defend against hostile nano weapons with their own intelligence is by building a wall of your own nanos that are loyal to you. And, uh, and then, of course, the question is, well, how do you guarantee these nanos are going to stay loyal to you? I mean, it's getting into realms that are, that are super science fiction-y, except they're not science fiction. And, and they sound like that to us, to me, because we don't know that much about science. But, but these are all within the realms of the short. So, well, I won't get it all. This is something else. So, you know, I, I think this whole issue of globalizing Palestine, of taking Palestine as the laboratory of a war against the people, and looking at the weapons and the systems of control and the whole concept of a security state that it gives birth to and, and understanding that it's really for exports to our countries in different ways, I think begins to, uh, to raise political issues that the left certainly should be more sensitized to because we're not we're not uh, geared into this sort of uh, of an issue. So I'll leave it at that.